All right, guys. Hey, happy uh, Wednesday, January 15th. This is day three of the Epic 5 Plan Metabolic Detox Detoxification Diet. Um, these are our daily detox sessions. Boy, that's a lot to say for me. Um, I am Dr. Jason Bradley, the founder of Epic Functional Medicine Center and the developer of uh, the Epic 5 Plan. Um, and uh, I am just so excited um, that we're doing this together. I'm so excited to see um, some folks on this call, and I've, I've been getting some really good feedback um, on these daily momentum sessions, and uh, I'm just glad that we're doing them. Um, I'm committed to doing these um, every day you know, this week, so we're going to have five this week, and it's going so well, and I'm feeling in the groove um, that I think we're going to continue it next week as well. Um, I'll get an outline of what we'll be talking about next week. We'll probably take it you know, to the next level. Um, and then I think that third week, um, we'll start, you know, even fine tuning it a little bit. And toward the end of the third week, um, we're going to be, uh, chatting about, you know, days 20, uh, days 22 and beyond since it's a 21 day detox. And, uh, at any rate, I'm just thrilled and honored to have you guys with me here today. Um, and, uh, today we're going to be discussing all things smoothie related. Um, we get a lot of questions about the Epic five, what's it called? The Epic green smoothie. This was created. Uh, with a lot of input. I mean, for as strange as it is to just have a smoothie um, that, you know, we recommend, you know, drinking every day, uh, we didn't just decide on, well, I wonder what tastes good. That was one of the things that we wanted. Um, but we, we really had a lot of input from nutritionists, health coaches, uh, of course, you know, our whole doctor team at Epic, my colleague doctors, um, other functional medicine providers, um, certainly um, validating in the scientific literature. And there was a ton of research and trial and error that went into this really basic thing. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of the background of it and then kind of lead you to where we are today and then even give you guys some advanced concepts um, to consider and, and even share some you know, clinical, clinical perspective or, or anecdotes maybe is a better way to say that. Um, but yeah, we've been using this smoothie in one form or another for at least at a bare minimum a decade. And uh, maybe not quite the way we use it today, but what we found over time is that, and, I, and I'm one of these people too, it all started with people don't like to take supplements. Uh, and, I, and I don't like to either. Um, you know, here you come in with some chronic illness, um, disease, uh, you know, symptoms, and you know, you're seeing this great team that you've heard about, uh, which is epic. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're really highly skilled at doing that medical detective work and finding those root causes and look, getting the bad stuff out, putting the good stuff in. And, it, you know, early in my career, and I don't know what that means, but I would, you know, I've been, in, I've been in practice now for, you know, a little over 20 years. October 22nd of last year uh, was, my, was my 20th year anniversary in practice. So 20 years in a few months. And, you know, in my 20s of practice, I've seen just about everything. And I have never seen anyone come in with a laundry list of drugs and then we give them a laundry list of supplements and they're like, oh, I feel good now, thank you. Nobody wants to be on those supplements, nobody wants to be on those drugs. And yet at the same time, when we run the labs, we find horrible, horrible, horrible deficiencies um, of, of nutrients specifically. Um, when, in fact, the longer of the list um, of the, of the medic medications that people are taking, um, the more nutrient deficiencies we see. And this is um, known in, in what well, should be known in medicine. I lecture on this at the medical school periodically. Um, every single drug, every single drug, I'll say it one more time, 100% of every single drug uses nutrients to work. Um, as an example, we were just talking about this in um, our grand rounds this morning with our team. Every single morning at Epic, uh, my whole team gets together at 8.30 in the morning. Um, we discuss you know, complicated cases. We discuss our cases of the day. Uh, you know, is there anything that we can help each other out with and all that kind of stuff that you do in, in kind of a grand rounds. Uh, and this morning it came up, this exact topic came up about drugs and nutrients and et cetera. And we, this was the example that I gave there. And I've lectured on this um, at, at the medical school here in Iowa City uh, a number of times. One really common drug is a statin drug. Um, statins are used to lower cholesterol. Um, the problem with statin drugs is they go through a biochemical pathway. I'm not going to make this too sciencey, but um, you guys know I'm a science. I'm a, I'm a total geek when it comes to it, especially biochemistry. Um, but um, statin drugs use a pathway in the body called the HMG CoA reductase pathway. Uh, and I and I see that um, one of my colleagues is actually on this call. So uh, by all means, please feel free to correct my uh, chemistry here if you'd like to. Uh, and thank you for thank you for joining us. Um, but nonetheless, HMG CoA reductase. And that pathway necessitates 
CoQ10 or ubiquinone, uh, ubiquinone um, uh, to, to work. Ubiquinone is known as, we get that word ubiquinone from ubiquitous hormone. Um, and in medicine, we just like to shove words together um, to make it sound like it's something new. So ubiquitous hormone became ubiquinone. We call it ubiquitous hormone because it's found everywhere. That's what ubiquitous means. It's everywhere. So it's this hormone found everywhere in the body. But specifically, it's stored in muscular tissue uh, and it's used to drive this HMGA um, CoA reductase pathway that is necessary when we take the statin drugs. So statins are known to deplete um, CoQ10 in the body. And uh, I, I mentioned that it was mentioned uh, that it's used. Um, he said again that CoQ10 is stored in the muscular tissue, but specifically it's really stored in the heart muscle, right? And so one of the side effects of statin drugs is something called rhabdomyolysis, where the body starts to break down muscular tissue. And that's where people get, you know, uh, pain and, and whatnot. And that's why the black label warning with those statin drugs um, from the FDA says, if you're experiencing body, you know, muscular pain or weakness, you need to get a hold of your pharmacist and doctor immediately, right? And the problem is that muscle pain, um, and, and again, why do we get that muscle pain? Because that drug needs CoQ10 and it's breaking down muscular tissue to get that CoQ10 to drive the drug pathway, right? Um, the problem is that usually doesn't show up for three to five years. And I consider myself a pretty darn good doctor, um, but if I prescribed uh, ubiquinone um, you know, some time ago, and uh, three to five years later, all of a sudden we have um, you know, somebody coming in with muscular pain and weakness, uh, I'm not gonna be able to put two and two together probably. Um, I mean, we're going to think that something happened to them. You know, maybe they're dehydrated. Maybe they're, maybe they, they did too much over the weekend. Right. And so a lot of times people will say, you know, here's a painkiller of some sort, take some Tylenol, take some NSAIDs, here's a prescription. Um, and that's kind of the way we handle it. And it's unfortunate because it really could be driven again by the lack of CoQ10 in the body. So in this lecture, um, you know, uh, I always get the same questions from the students, uh, the residents that say, Hey, why don't we just prescribe CoQ10? Why aren't we told that? Uh, when we, to, in pharmacology, when we're, we're learning about these drugs. And I always say, I don't know, wouldn't it be cool if they took statin drugs and put CoQ10 together? And that way we don't have to worry about that. Wouldn't that be cool if they took every drug and they combined it with the nutrient that it needs We put that together? I don't know why we don't do that. I think there's a whole, I mean, God, who knows, maybe the next you know, multi-billion dollar industry is to do that. Maybe those of us watching this uh, uh, video um, can start that company and uh, tweak the drugs and add, uh, add the nutrients to it. But anyway, that's a different story. The point is um, drugs deplete nutrients. Um, nobody wants to be on a laundry list of drugs. Nobody wants to be on a laundry list of nutrients, but we find that necessity. necessity. So we started working on a project called Food, Food is Medicine or Food is Medicine, depending on um, which one of my team members that you talk about or talk to. Um, and we started to make lists of here's a bunch of foods and with these nutrients. And again, you know, with my clients, um, if I do prescribe something like um, CoQ10 or vitamin D or vitamin A or whatever, iodine, whatever it happens to be, whatever nutrient we, nutrients we find deficient, we might say, here's a prescription for that nutrient, but here are the foods that you should be eating to start bulking your body up so we can get off of that, uh, that prescription and hopefully all the prescriptions um, over time. And again, just kind of using a food as medicine approach. And uh, we're also working on that list of here's the drugs and here's the nutrients they deplete. We're working on that actually um, from that conversation this morning. So rather than, you know, try to give people a laundry list of nutrients, a lot of people say, is there any way, whether it's budgetary reasons or I just don't want to swallow capsules, um, is there anything that I could do instead of taking supplements? So we started putting together, well, you know, what would the diet look like, which eventually became the Epic 5 plan uh, diet, which we're doing together today. Um, and then, um, you know, also what, you know, what could we do as something quick? I always say quick and dirty, but I should say quick and easy. Is there something that we could do that's quick and easy? Uh, to help get dense nutrients into the body. And so we started you know, saying, well, if we added this and did this and put this in there and did this, we start to develop what I would call a foods-based multivitamin. Um, and if we're consistent with it, um, this, this smoothie that we're gonna go over here in a minute, um, I truly believe that it's dense enough in the majority of the vitamins and minerals that we need that it probably could, could replace for a lot of people, maybe not in that really early state of acute care um, for, you know, chronic conditions that, that really, you know, really intensive care for chronic conditions. Um, but, you know, down the road, I don't want people to have to take a multivitamin the rest of their life. Um, I'd rather have you drink in a green smoothie every day. So we started putting, you know, combinations of, well, we're going to need minerals. What's, 
What's high in minerals? You know what? Green leafy vegetables, right? Um, you know, what about, you know, and, and, and also, you know, vegetables in general. So we throw cruciferous vegetables in there. You know, what about, you know, vitamins? Well, those are, those are there as well. But what about berries? They're pretty high in vitamins. And if we have a mix of berries, we get a mix of vitamins. Um, and then, uh, you know, these, they just kind of fell together. And eventually what we came up with was what's known as the Epic Green Smoothie. Um, Rachel and I uh, are actually, uh, we actually have, uh, a, we actually have this whole thing ready to go. Um, that's very similar to what we're doing right now. That is called the uh, the no detox detox. Um, and what we mean by that is a complete detox plan, just like we're doing now, that has no products involved, which is what we're doing right now, right? Um, the idea that we can gain uh, lifestyle and diet to detoxify the body without using specific products. Now, I know a lot of my colleagues like to prescribe liver cleansers and you know detox agents and all this stuff, but I and I'm not saying they don't work. I just don't know in my experience if they work any better than what we're doing. Um, and I like the idea again of less is more. You know, um, I was at a medical conference once and there was a medical philosopher there from Russia. I wish I knew his name. I would have loved to have kept in touch with him. Um, but he, he, somebody was talking about something very complex um, and a lot of, you know, throw this at this and here's a drug and here's a supplement and do, you know, this and that and the other thing. And if you've been to an integrated medical conference, that's kind of the way it works. So I'm, this guy stood up from Russia and he said, you know, I think that we should always question our, uh, what he called uh, moral authority to intervene with the body. And I think that we should always be asking what's the least that we can do to have the most effect in the body. And I wanna say that he didn't say moral majority, um, that's a political term. Um, he was talking about the doctor acting as God, the moral authority to say, oh, you need this, you need all this stuff. And I'm smarter than mother nature and I can outsmart mother nature and this is what we're going to do, right? And I like his approach of what's, and, I, and it stuck with me, what's the least we can do to have the greatest effect on the system? Um, and again, I wish I knew who that guy was. I'd give him credit. Um, but that, that, I mean, and everybody kind of half the class, half the class, half the audience, uh, I would say actually about a 10th of the audience applauded. I was one of them. And then everyone else looked at him like, what the heck are you talking about? Or I totally disagree. Uh, medical conferences are always fun when that stuff happens. Um, but nonetheless, uh, so we created this green smoothie originally to replace the multivitamin, at least with ongoing care. There might be a reason up front to throw somebody on. And, and again, I do this with my clients, as you guys know, um, that are my clients. I put people on a multivitamin up front um, because I'm just trying to do a shotgun approach, fill everything in, in that we can, make sure there's no deficiencies. And then we get that lab testing back. Sometimes they need to stay on that multivitamin um, for various reasons um, to, to keep building and bolstering. Other times I take them off that and put them on specific nutrients. Either way, I'm putting them on a food as medicine approach, eat these foods high in these nutrients um, and start on that Epic Green Smoothie from day one. Um, so it started out just that simple, right? But then it got nuanced. I mean, we got, um, we got a lot of input here We've tried that mixed with various powders. Um, we've tried that. We've tried a lot of things in this in this Epic Green smoothie. Um, and essentially, what's stuck and what we see the best response is, um, and it's also a great way to break your fasting. Whether that's breakfast, that's where we get that word "break fast," right? We're breaking our fast from the overnight, or whether that is, um, uh, you know, intermittent fasting. This is a great way to break your fasting period. Um, just starting with the smoothie. It's, it's pre-digested because it's a smoothie. It's all broken down, right? It's just uh, uh, pulverized, uh, pulverized food that we're drinking. So the nutrients are readily available. There's not a lot of digestion that needs to happen. Um, so we pre-digested it. Uh, and then also it's, it's low in calories and low glycemic, right? Um, so we're sending the body, and it's, and it's full of liquid. So we're sending the body a, a signal of hydration, a signal of, of vitamins and minerals, um, cofactors and coenzymes, you know, chemistry that's good for our body. Um, and it's also very easy to digest. So it's a great way to break the fast. So that was an added benefit. We hadn't thought about that. We also started thinking again about the, the, green, um, uh, the greens and the cruciferous vegetables, right? Um, they're gonna be full of fiber. And we start thinking, wow, this is a great way to increase fiber in people's bodies. And, it's, and especially now that we've developed the Epic Five plan, um, you guys know that we want five to 13 cups of vegetables a day. You know, Dr. Walls in her Walls protocol wants nine cups of vegetables a day. Um, we have a little overlap there. We're a little bit kinder than nine cups, um, but we want that fiber content for sure. And so that was a cool little additive, um, uh, added benefit. Um, you know, throw just, just the greens and the cruciferous vegetables um, are a great way to get fiber in. Sometimes people need more fiber and we just recommend things like psyllium seed husks or chia seeds or flax seeds. Um, you know, one tablespoon of psyllium or chia 
has about five grams of fiber. Um, one tablespoon of flax uh, seeds has about 2.7 grams of fiber. Um, so again, um, that's kind of, again, the advanced smoothie. Uh, but in the basic, we already have the fiber built in for a lot of people. We also started thinking, and, and again, the vitamins and minerals, um, we also start thinking about the cruciferous vegetables. Um, cruciferous vegetables are high in uh, sulfur. I can't say the word. Um, uh, and uh, uh, my doctor colleagues that are on the call, if you could somehow phonetically uh, put this into the chat box, that'd be great. Sulforaphane. For, sulforaphane. I can't say that word. Sulfur. Um, uh, I'm just going to shorten it. Um, they're high in sulfur and they, and they drive a detox pathway um, that opens up uh, detoxification channels in the liver, in that P450 system. Um, to get junk out of the system. So now we're actually affecting detox in the diet, I mean, and detox with this, with this green smoothie, um, easy peasy. Um, and also those same cruciferous vegetables, again, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, you know, radishes, turnips, mustard greens, you know, turnip greens, all that uh, arugula, let's not forget that. Um, all of that stuff is not only full of sulfur, but it's also full of um, diendyl methane, and indole 3 carbonyl sometimes shortened as DIM and I3C, those, those chemicals help balance out hormones. So now all of a sudden in this really simple smoothie, you know, um, not only getting vitamins and minerals and we're getting fiber, um, we're now starting to, uh, and opening up detoxification channels, we're now balancing out um, hormones, you know, with this, with this very simple um, food-based approach. We add in the berries and yeah, we actually added the berries first, for sweetness. Um, we were trying to say, how could we sweeten this thing and not make it high in sugar or high in, in carbs? And so, of course, we experimented with things like stevia and monk fruit, which I can't stand anything. I wouldn't call those artificial sweeteners. I wouldn't put an artificial sweetener in my body, um, except by accident, if somebody paid me, um, unless it was a whole lot of money that I could do good for the world with, I guess. Um, but um, I've actually had uh, sucralose toxicity. I actually had a neurological reaction um, to having too much sucralose. Um, very, very, very long time ago, um, I was fast, I mean, not, not fascinated. I was, I, I was using sucralose um, to sweeten everything. Uh, that's called Splenda, I think, commercially. And um, again, uh, it caused a neurological reaction. It was like a neurotoxin to me. I got hit with a migraine. I felt, I felt like my head was going to explode. Um, I went to the ER. It was horrible. And it, it lasted for three days. They were going to send me to neurology. Um, and again, we never, and it went away and I, you know, didn't get anything done. And then um, not too far down the road, I had some more sucralose and instantly, and I was like, oh, that's what it is. Um, so I, I have personally stayed away from that stuff, not to mention it is probably a neurotoxin, an, an endocrine toxin, an immunological toxin. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of, of things to stay away from that are artificial. But even with the natural sweeteners like stevia, monk fruit, um, you know, those can be problems. Uh, uh, or I'm sorry, a lot of people don't like the flavor of those. Um, I don't like the flavor of those. I think they're almost too sweet, even when in minuscule amounts. Um, Rachel, my Rachel, uh, uh, my, my far better half in every single way, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, the brains behind the operation and my boss at work and my boss at home. Um, Rachel likes to have stevia in her tea and, uh, I'll let you guys know right now that I don't even want to, to even remotely have the spoon that went into her tea to stir it up, to even touch my tea or anything that I'm going to eat. Um, I, it's, I can't even stand the taste of it. Um, and a lot of people tell me the same thing. Um, it can leave a bitter taste in the mouth. It can be too sweet for people. Um, it, it probably, probably isn't problematic for the body. Um, so I don't want to discourage anybody necessarily from using that. But I also am a big fan of resetting what we call the bliss point and not having sweets at all. So that when we eat things like berries, they're super sweet, right? So berries to me are amazingly sweet foods. Um, in fact, it's probably, I think it is the sweetest thing that I eat um, at all. Um, so again, berries um, act as a sweet. Uh, but then while we're on, the, on natural sweeteners, I want to just talk about things like erythritol and mannitol and things like that. All those OLs at the end, those, they're called sugar alcohols. Again, those are what we call inert sugars. What that means is that um, they aren't well absorbed in the body. And even if they are, they do not cause an insulin response. And again, that's why we want a low sugar load or a low glycemic load diet, which is what the smoothie is. And it's certainly what the Epic 5 plan diet is. Um, we don't want those sugar alcohol. I mean, sorry. Um, we don't want a high amount of sugar because we want to tr try to control insulin as well. Um, but nonetheless, sugar alcohols are sweet, but they don't cause an insulin response. Um, they don't have a negative effect at all um, with, with diabetics, et cetera. Now that said, they can cause 
GI disruption. And we see this a lot. I see a lot of people with loose bowels, sometimes um, uh, what we call uh, blowout bowels, right? Um, where they can't control their bowels and they got to get to the bathroom right now, or there's going to be a massive problem and a massive cleanup. And um, it's interesting. I didn't put that all together until now, if I, if re, no, I wouldn't say recently, but last five, five, 10 years or so. Um, and I, I, now if I see anybody with that, that type of loose bowel uh, at all, watery bowel, or certainly that blowout bowel um, uh, that we've ruled out C. diff and stuff like that, um, infections, uh, certainly I, I always want to know, are they having sugar alcohols? And I would say probably eight times out of 10, um, there's some sugar alcohols involved. They're trying to avoid sugar. They're trying to make smart choices. And they're, they're, they're having drinks and foods that are sweetened with that. So again, I would stay away from that stuff. Um, again, we're trying to reset the bliss point anyway, so that we don't want sweets. And when we have sweets, even, even stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, et cetera, certainly the artificial sweeteners, um, it, it kind of cocks and loads the gun of the body to think that you're going to get sugar and instant fuel and it gets all ready for it. And then nothing happens. Um, and so the body keeps expectingly waiting it. So then you start craving sweets and craving sweets and craving sweets because your body wants that sugar. We are programmed to want sugar uh, because sugar is an instant fuel. And until very, very, very recently in human history, and I mean recently as in uh, like the last 100 years or less, maybe 50 years, um, we didn't have the amount of sugar available to us as a human species as we do now. Um, so we've created this sugar addiction um, and then we try to unwind it by using artificial sweeteners or, or natural, um, you know, neutral sugars, uh, our sweeteners, um, inert sweeteners, uh, like we just mentioned. Um, and instead what we're doing is we're just making the body crave it even more. So, I mean, the treatment is don't use it anymore. Um, only stick with whole foods, right? Um, again, to quote Michael Pollan, um, eat real foods, uh, mostly, uh, mostly vegetables and not too much. I think that that's a great plan for all of us. So nonetheless, the berry started out as a sweet but then we started thinking about it. Um, you know, different berries have different activities. Um, you know, uh, Rachel the other day, uh, my Rachel did a um, video on how to make this smoothie. So please look at that. It's in the Epic Five feed for sure. Um, I think it's on our YouTube channel as well. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, Rachel did a video and she was using wild blueberries. In the literature, as an example, wild blueberries are shown to help uh, feed or grow or colonize, depending on the word you wanna use here, good probiotic bacteria in the gut, right? Not all berries do that. But I think all berries do it to a certain extent, but wild blueberries are great for that, right? Um, so she had, and they're, also, they're actually, you know, quite low in sugar. Um, so again, she used some wild blueberries. She also used raspberries and blackberries. We almost always want to use um, some berries with seeds on the outside because those seeds are also high in dienilomethane and, and endothricarbonyl, DIM, and, uh, excuse me, I3C. Again, those same chemicals that help balance the hormones. So here we are balancing hormones again. And berries, as we know, are, are very potent antioxidants. Um, antioxidants, as we know, um, take care of free radicals. Um, free radicals are chemicals in the body that have been shown to lead to cancers. So again, now all of a sudden, are we, you know, I can't say we're treating cancers or preventing cancers, but man, the literature certainly suggests things like that, right? So again, um, we've got the greens, we've got cruciferous vegetables in there. Again, Arugula can count as both of those. Kale could count as both of those, right? Um, uh, uh, we've got berries. We're get, so for the sweet, we're getting fiber. Um, you know, we're getting uh, vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, opening up detoxification pathways, um, balancing out hormones. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. And so then we added in um, an acid, some type of acid like lemon juice, lime juice, apple cider vinegar. We usually just pour some. Uh, uh, organic um, lemon juice. Um, we get the bottled kind. You can use fresh lemons if you want. Um, I found to me that they're messy. I'm a little type A and kind of an organizational, kind of a neat freak. And I don't personally like to be sticky. Um, I know I, I, we all have our, our issues. And when I'm squeezing lemons, that lemon gets on me and it gets a little sticky and I just don't like it. So I just like to pour it in there, but we always make sure to get the organic, uh, you know, um, lemon juice concentrate. Um, that's just hundred percent pure lemon juice. And then, um, we also like to add in, um, apple cider vinegar, of course, organic. Um, I like, I'm not trying to promote a, a brand here, but we, we buy Bragg's, um, B-R-A-G-G-S. The reason we buy Bragg's apple cider vinegar, um, is it's organic. And then also it has what's called the mother in there. So there is actually bacteria in the apple cider vinegar and it's, and it's, uh, it's got probiotics in there as well. So again, um, there, so now we've, now we're adding probiotics in. 
the acids that we're adding in are to stimulate digestion. Um, and again, uh, digestion starts with, first of all, why do we eat food, right? We got to digest it. We start with these big food molecules. Um, we chomp on it. We break it down into little bits. It falls down into the tummy. And then the stomach starts to secrete hydrochloric acid. The job of the acid is to break down that food even more. The job of that acid is to, is to uh, kill off pathogens just in case you had some bacteria um, or a yeast or a fungus or a mold or something on the food that you were eating. Um, hopefully not, but if you did, hopefully the acid levels are enough to kill that off. Um, and if you have enough acid, probably it is. A lot of us don't have enough acid. Um, so again, we're doing a little re replenishment there. Um, and then also the job of that acid, when it mixes with that food and it passes from the stomach into the small intestine, it passes through uh, by something called the common bile duct. Um, and that's where our pancreas, um, a little tube from our pancreas connects um, to the uh, small intestine. And then the, the, the tubes from the liver and the gallbladder um, uh, connect and the pancreas secretes more digestive enzymes. Again, what do the enzymes do? Break down the food, smaller bits, get the nutrients out. Um, and then what does the bile, uh, what does liver and gallbladder secrete? Uh, bile and bile salts, again, breaking down fats, um, uh, also breaking down some hormones. Um, certainly the bile salts, again, are antipathogenic. So again, they're gonna, they're gonna kill off pathogens. Um, again, uh, bacteria, yeast, molds, funguses, et cetera. So again, that acid serves a lot Again, um, right up front, and it's a really great way to stimulate the body first thing in the morning um, to add these things in. It's, it's not difficult um, at all. Uh, we use, if you watch that video, um, we typically use, um, well, we have a Ninja. Uh, I don't know if it's called a Ninja blender or what that's called, but we have you know, all the different things that you can set on top. We have, of course, a regular blender uh, you know, container that looks like a blender. Um, but then we also have these like single serving cups, uh, and that's what Rachel used in that video, where we just put the ingredients in, um, put the, the blades on, turn it upside down, blend it, pulverize it, um, and then you're ready to go. We add some water in there as well, just for texture. Um, and again, you can decide how to do that yourself. Um, you know, some people like them really, really uh, liquidy. Some people don't like them liquidy. Um, you know, as far as berries go, I just wanted to also say, we also use typically frozen berries. Um, and that's because we live in Iowa and we're not in the berry season. If there was a way for me to get fresh berries um, in winter, I would totally do that. Um, but we make sure to get frozen berries that are flash frozen. Um, they're picked fresh and they're flash frozen um, to preserve as much as we can. The studies have shown that flash frozen berries um, are just as nutritionally dense as um, fresh picked berries right off the vine. So again, um, we use a lot of frozen because otherwise, I don't know where those berries came from. Um, I don't know how long they've been on the shelf. I swear, and this is my experience, and God bless all of um, the grocery stores. Uh, you know, I'm not a farmer. Um, I couldn't eat without food being available to me. Um, but I swear, we buy raspberries. I, I swear, I'm not even joking. We buy them at the store. I'm very careful. I look, I look in the container. I don't see any mold. Um, we get home, and within about five hours, I, I swear, it's, there's mold growing. Uh, and I'm teasing a little bit, but certainly within a day um, or two, sometimes that happens. Then I feel like I just wasted the berries. Um, and, and again, uh, that's just me. So we use flash frozen berries. I personally don't like frozen berries in my smoothie. So I take those frozen berries and I put them in the fridge and keep them in the fridge so that they're just, you know, they're cold, uh, but they're not, they're not frozen. Rachel likes frozen berries. Um, she likes frozen drinks. So again, you can, you can kind of game this however you want it. Um, you know, and, and we try to rotate our berries. Um, we try to use different greens, different cruciferous vegetables. Um, you know, uh, but that's kind of what we, we add in there some type of green, cruciferous vegetable, um, uh, uh, berries, uh, lemon juice, and apple cider vinegar, five ingredients, and then water, of course, um, just five ingredients. So very, very simple. And, and think about all those different areas that we're helping with um, the body. I mean, it, like I said, that didn't happen overnight. Some of that was accidental. Um, a lot of that was based on taste and texture and just thinking of a multivitamin. But man, it's just, it's just so awesome. Um, yeah, so Christy asked if kale is as, as good to eat every day. I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna give you a short answer, no. Um, however, there's always, you know I'm always gonna give you a, uh, a $2 answer for a, a five cent question, right? Um, I don't think, let me tell you why I said no. Um, I don't think that any food is okay to eat every day. Um, in fact, the studies have shown if we eat the same food every single day, um, we can develop an intolerance to it, right? Uh, and, or sensitivity. So I would say mix, mix around for that reason alone. Um, there's a lot of studies. If you go to pubmed.gov, 
Um, and again, that's where you should be going to get your medical um, research. Don't go to go Dr. Google, just go to pubmed.gov um, and you can look these things up, right? Um, Cause that's where, uh, that's a, uh, a government index of all of the medical literature from all around the world. I think from like 1976, um, uh, Dr. Hall's on this call and she might know that number better. Um, but anyway, it's, it's from a long time ago. And then even before that, um, you can, you can get, uh, some of the, some of the abstracts. Um, and certainly, you know, if we go really back in time, Google can come in. If you go to Google, I think it's scholar.google.com. I might have messed that up. Um, but Google, I just call it Google scholar. Um, uh, it's also an index of the medical literature, but also some, uh, Google scholar does a really good job of taking out of print, uh, medical textbooks. Um, that, you know, are kind of lost from yesteryear that have tons of pearls of wisdom in there. And they've actually copied it so that you can have access to old medical textbooks um, and old medical um, data that was lost in kind of this new um, data set that we have at PubMed. Um, so Google has a place. Uh, but anyway, uh, Christy, I would say don't have um, the same foods every day, including kale. Um, I think there are worse foods that you could have every day. The other reason I would rotate your foods, um, and again, I would, I would rotate things, is because every single food is gonna have a, a slightly different nutrient structure. Um, so, you know, what might be, one food might be high in iodine, another food might be high in magnesium, another food might be high in zinc, um, especially when we're talking about like the green vegetables. Um, so again, I would, I would rotate for a couple of reasons. Um, I will tell you what we do. Um, we, you know, we, we have a bag of kale. You know, we get that, that bag of organic kale. I don't know why it comes in a plastic bag. I wish that it didn't. Um, but that's the way it's sold at our local market. Uh, and so we get that bag of kale and we'll, we'll usually make a couple days of smoothies out of that, right? Cause that's about for, for at least the two of us, um, we can get, you know, out of that bag of kale that becomes about four smoothies. Um, so again, we'll use a, use it a couple days in a row and then we'll switch to arugula and then we'll use that for, you know, a couple days in a row, um, and, and kind of, you know, eat that arugula. And then maybe we switch to, um, sometimes spinach. Um, I'm a little careful with spinach because of the oxalates. Um, for those of you that have been following me for a while, you know that, was it last year or the year before? It seems like so long ago. I think it was a couple of years ago. I had a kidney stone and I eat like, I mean, I watch my diet. Like I, I make a joke here, but like second to religion, right? Um, uh, I'm very conscious of what I eat. Um, I've been in a very unhealthy state before. I'll never let myself get that way again. I'll do everything I can to get, keep from being there. Um, but so I was, you know, eating a lot of spinach. Um, I was drinking no sodas. I was drinking, you know, my, my, my tea. Uh, my, I drank iced tea like it was going out of style. And uh, of course, tea and spinach are really high in oxalates. And I got um, uh, calcium oxalate crystals in my kidneys. And let me just tell you, as a man, I don't know what birth, uh, childbirth is like, but I felt like it could not have been any more painful than what I went through. Um, the, some of the women that, have, that I've had as clients that have given childbirth and had a kidney stone have said to me, I don't know if it was to validate me and make me feel better, um, but they've said that um, their kidneys don't hurt worse than birth. So again, uh, and that's actually where I met Dr. Todd Conway, um, who practiced with uh, Epic until he retired. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he was an ER doctor there. And uh, uh, we had a fun time practicing uh, for about, oh, almost a year together. And then he decided it was time. He had retired from the ER, joined us for a short stint and then, and then left. But I met him as my kidney doctor, my kidney stone doctor. Uh, in the ER. And that's a funny story that I'll share another day. Um, but nonetheless, um, I would rotate. And I hope that that answered that question. There's a number of reasons to rotate. Um, so again, real basic, I'm going to cover that. And then I'm going to go to some advanced topics. Um, first of all, greens, cruciferous vegetables, they can overlap a little bit. Berries, primarily with seeds on the outside. But um, if it has the word berry in it, it's probably okay. We're not talking about fruit juices here, guys. We're talking about the whole foods, right? Uh, and we're not talking about making a juice out of this stuff. We're talking about a smoothie. Um, and then add your acids in. So I mentioned earlier um, fiber. And, you know, I've been researching fiber a little bit um, here recently because when somebody asks me a question, I like to know not only the quick answer, but I like to know the history of how we got to where we are. So again, I've been watching those of us that are in the practice of medicine that, that pay attention to this. Um, we've noticed that the dietary recommendations for fiber have crept up from you know, 25 grams to 35 grams to 45. I mean, it just keeps going up and up and up a little bit. And um, again, I don't know who makes those rules. Um, some, somebody at some, you know, United States Department of fill in the blank um, comes up with these rules of fiber. And so somebody asked me the other day, hey, how many grams of fiber should I be getting in a day? So I looked it up and I'm like, well, I wonder where we got there. 
Uh, and I, and I kind of looked at it a little bit and, you know, of course the literature shows that a higher fiber diet um, is, is definitely related to um, lower incidence of chronic illnesses and diseases and symptoms, but certainly also expanding um, the lifespan. So it's, it's related to longevity. It's also related to increasing the health span, keeping us healthier for a longer period of time. So, I mean, that's the goal, right? Live as long as you can, as healthy as you can. Um, and fiber is definitely key for that. Um, so I started looking at, you know, I wonder what historically, like a long time ago, um, prehistoric humans ate for fiber. And we, we know this based on, uh, interestingly enough, um, based on their, their preserved fecal matter, which is kind of weird, right? Um, uh, and sometimes once in a while, we'll find like pre preserved food stores, uh, storage, but mostly it's, it's in their fecal matter. Um, for those of you that don't know this, and I don't share this whole lot, um, my life before I got into medicine, um, I was actually in anthropology. In undergraduate, I was in physical anthropology, um, where I studied stuff like archaeology and, and the physical remains of prehistoric cultures. Um, I was fascinated with that stuff. Um, I first went to graduate school um, before med medicine um, in economic anthropology, and I got to spend some great time in Europe um, studying, this is going to make me old, um, the European Union was just getting formed. And um, Ireland has just joined, and I was uh, doing ethnography studies of dairy farmers, um, of family farms that, ha that were trying to trade in the European Union, um, that had taken loans out to meet the European Union standards, um, and then banks were foreclosing on them, and corporate farms were coming in like vultures and taking these family farms. And there was a massive um, exodus from the family farm and into um, the cities like Dublin. Um, kind of the same, and I was fascinated with that because I'm from Iowa, and the same stuff happened in Iowa in the 80s, right? Um, and my, I'm from a, uh, my mom at least is from a farming family. So, you know, my, my, her brother um, took over that farm. It's been in their family for a long time, but in the eighties, uh, it was a hard time for farming. I think it's a hard time for farming um, still today. Um, so anyways, I got to spend some time over there studying that stuff um, and learning about economics, but um, nonetheless, uh, in their fecal matter, we found out that um, prehistoric humans, and, and again, there's some variables here, but had at least 50 grams a day. And now they're suggesting even up to 100 grams of fiber a day. That's a lot of fiber. I just want you guys to know that's a lot of fiber. 50 grams is a lot of fiber. When I have my patients track um, you know, their fiber intake and the way that I have them do that, I have them use apps or if they don't have a smartphone, just go to the internet and uh, find any online you know, calculator like a food journal that will break it down to its um, macronutrients, its micronutrients, and fiber is going to be one of them. Most of my patients that track their fiber tell me they come in between 25 and 35 grams a day um, with even trying to eat um, whole foods. And so uh, I always tell people, you know, uh, let's try to get up to 50 grams a day. And again, so sometimes with those people, I'll say you can use, again, psyllium seed husks, um, chia seeds, flax seeds, depends on the person. Uh, but again, one gram, I'm sorry, one tablespoon of, of each of those has uh, two and a half to five grams of fiber, um, as I mentioned before. Um, you know, some people, uh, always at, everybody always asks about protein. You know, should I be adding protein powder is what they mean to my smoothie. And that got me thinking, you know, should they, or shouldn't they, some of the old detox products, um, that we would use had different types of protein in there. I kind of started shying away from them because most of them are going to be, uh, uh, whey protein. And as you guys know, um, I'm not a big fan of cow dairy for lots of reasons. There's a reason, uh, I mean, many a host of, of immunological reasons, um, dietary reasons. Um, uh, there's there's a, metabolic reasons. The list could go on and on, but I'm not a big fan of cow dairy uh, for, for almost everybody. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, uh, in The Plant Paradox, uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry covers uh, dairy, I think, pretty well. Um, it's not a science, it's kind of a sciencey book, but it's written for the general population. And he does a, a, a really great chapter on dairy. Um, and I would, I would, you know, get that. I was gonna say, listen to it. I did an audio book on that, but nonetheless, um, Gundry does a good job there, but, um, I'm not a big dairy guy. Uh, so I don't want whey soy. Um, again, uh, soy can be helpful, can be problematic. Um, hundred percent of it in the United States is GMO soy. Um, or it's probably like 98%, but um, nothing's ever 100%, but nearly all of it's GMO soy. We don't even know what that means as far as long-term studies. Um, certainly soy um, is full of lectins. Um, lectins are plant, protein, are plant poisons, um, gluten being the most famous uh, lectin, but um, there's a ton of uh, uh, plant poisons. Um, you know, uh, other, other um, uh, protein powders are based on um, 
things like rice proteins or pea proteins. Again, lectins, lectins keep coming up. Um, so for, I just kind of shied away from it, but I still get this question. And so I said, well, people are going to ask. And so I need to know. And what we found out was our good friend, um, uh, uh, Dave Asprey, who founded Bulletproof. I'm sure you guys are uh, familiar with Bulletproof. Um, uh, Dave is a huge supporter of functional medicine. Um, just, just, just a, a fantastic guy that's spending his life trying to, you know, figure out how to stay healthy and how to help other people be healthy. Um, but he has a great product that's a collagen protein. Um, that's, and again, if you knew Dave, he is a freak show with, with purity. Um, kind of like uh, Howard Hughes level of, of uh, being afraid of mold and toxins and et cetera. So everything goes through purity testing. Um, you have to pay a little extra for Bulletproof products, but not much. And it's so worth it because you know you're getting a pure product. But you know, collagen protein, if you feel compelled to add protein, um, you could do that, collagen protein. And then of course I get my vegetarian, vegan people that say, I get that, but I don't wanna add collagen in because it's animal products. So figure it out, Bradley. So I do. Um, it, took me, it took me longer to figure this next piece out um, than, than I care to tell you. Uh, it was almost impossible to find a vegetarian, a vegan even, uh, based protein uh, powder that was lectin-free, but I found one. Um, and I'm, I'm not promoting this company, but it's the only product I know. Um, I am promoting uh, Bulletproof. Man, it's a, it's a great product line across the board. It's well thought out. But nonetheless, um, um, Designs for Health makes a product called Pure P, P-E-A. And it's a pea protein. Um, and it's, uh, I'm pretty sure it's chickpeas. I think that's where it comes from. But they actually ferment it. They ferment their, 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 their peas. And they actually test it to make sure that it's lectin-free. They're the only company that I know about. I actually had to um, uh, uh, get a hold of Mark Hyman, um, kind of the, the, the father of functional medicine right now. If, if Dr. Jeffrey Bland is the grandfather um, and, and Linus Pauling is the great-great-grandfather um, or the great-grandfather, then uh, Mark Hyman is the father right now of, of functional medicine. And um, he's, he's the one that let me know about that. And I called the company because I don't, you know, I got to do my fact checking. And the customer service agent actually didn't know. And I ended up talking to a technical rep and they said, yeah, that's the way it's done. So pure pea protein from Designs for Health is a vegetarian, vegan source of protein. Um, and again, I don't know another one. Um, people always ask me, what about, I won't name the names, but fill in the blank of every other protein. I contact those companies and they say, we don't test for that. So if they're not testing for it, they're not doing it. Um, they, they, there's lectins in there, or at least we should be suspicious. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you could add that. You could get some protein. And if you feel so compelled to have protein, um, people always want to know about, well, we're talking about Epic Five. You know, we've got um, vegetables. Um, we've talked about healthy protein options. Um, we've talked about uh, berries. We've talked about acids. But what about fat? You can certainly add fat to this smoothie, right? Um, there's various ways to do this. Um, you know, I can't say this for everybody, but a lot of people like to put coconut oil or MCT oil, mixed chain triglyceride oil derived from coconut oil, um, into their smoothie. I think for a lot of people, that's a good choice. There are some people that don't process um, saturated fats like coconut oil very well. So again, um, you got to be careful. Make sure you talk to your doctor about that stuff. It's probably okay, but I can't say universally that it's okay. You could probably also add some olive oil or some um, avocado oil or even just throw in an avocado, right? Um, and again, um, you can just blend that up, texture it down with some water and drink it down. And if we really think about it and, and really um, just think about this, We've got greens, cruciferous vegetables, berries. Um, we've got uh, um, you know fiber that we could add in. We've got acids. We've added protein. We've added we've added fat, and you could. It's literally like a liquid meal. Um, you know, I've never done the 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 breakdown of calories and fats and proteins as that. I probably should do that. That'd be a fun thing to do, and uh, maybe before the book gets printed, um, I'll I'll have that in there. That'd be. I, in fact, I'm going to do that. Uh, I just gave myself a new project. Um, in real time right in front of you guys. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's basically a whole meal. Um, and I, I do have some very chronically ill patients that just can't digest foods well. Um, and sometimes we have to manipulate this a little bit, that we put them on a liquids only diet. And this is the liquids only that I give them, right? I mean, they can have this. Um, we do broths either. I like chicken broth um, for these folks um, or bone broth even better. But sometimes we have to use vegetable broth um, if they're uh, sensitive to... Um, you know, various things that might be in bone broths or if they're vegetarian, vegan, something like that. 
um, you know, certainly a lot of water. And I'm not suggesting that you guys do this, but for chronically ill people that have a hard time digesting foods and deriving nutrients, this is a great way to get nutrients into them, right? So again, um, I'm not suggesting that you do this. I would talk to your doctor um, about this. If you're my patient, um, just message me and I'll probably say, do it if you wanna try it, right? Um, there, are, there are some days that I do a liquids only day. I wouldn't say it's weekly, but I would say um, at least accidentally, a, a, you know, a couple times a month, um, I just won't eat. Not because I'm not trying to not eat. I'm drinking a lot of water through the day. It's just I was so darn busy that I just didn't get to it. And it's 11 p.m. and I don't feel like I don't want to put food in my body, right? So I end up having a liquids only day, a fasting day. Um, and, and again, not sometimes not intentional. Sometimes I fast intentionally. Um, and I always just say, oh, there was my fasting day. Great, I got it done. Uh, so again, this is a great way to get nutrients into your system. And again, I won't go through that list, but you can, you can kind of advance game this a little bit and make a whole meal out of this and kind of get all of your bases covered. And I have had a lot of chronically ill people, you know, use what I just outlined, um, you know, daily, you know, three to five, six times a day, they are pretty filling, right? But, you know, multiple times a day as their food and slowly, but surely over time, these people get better, right? Uh, I don't have a whole lot of patients that are in that severe of a state. I don't think there's, you know, a ton of people out there that are in that severe state, but they do come to me. Um, and again, I always say that we've seen everything from fatigue to cancer at Epic um, and had to figure it out for everybody. Uh, but that all said, I hope that helped with the Epic Green Smoothie. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're right at about the 45 minute mark. So I'm going to just kind of give a last call for um, uh, questions and make sure that I've answered everybody's questions that are on the call. Uh, and give any clarity that I can, but I hope that helped. And I hope that not only do we understand how to do it, but also the more important thing is why we're doing this and how it's so important to overall health and why I recommend it every single day for every single one of my clients. Um, uh, you know, at least one a day, sometimes they say one to three a day. If you ever want to, you know, if you ever, you know, want to quote, skip a meal, this is a great way to skip a meal and just drink one of those down. That said, I'm going to just quickly say, I'm um, speaking of fasting. Uh, I will be at Natural Grocers uh, this Saturday here in Iowa City. I'll be, they have something called the Resolution Reset Day. Um, it's kind of their corporate uh, kind of health promotion day. Um, they're going to have a number of speakers. I speak at 10 a.m. Um, Central Time at the local Natural Grocers. Uh, I will be in some way either recording that or streaming it or streaming and recording it. Um, but I will make sure that those of you that can't attend um, get to hear that. Um, the title of my lecture is, let's see, Fasting Your Way to Vitality, A Deep Dive into Intermittent Fasting. We're going to look at, um, you know, the fad of intermittent fasting, um, why it's a fad, what it purportedly helps with, um, what's the science behind it, and is it safe and is it for everybody? So I'm going to be covering all of that on Saturday. Um, I was supposed to speak on CBS uh, uh, and Fox this morning on that topic too, on fasting, but I couldn't get to our affiliate station uh, here in, well, near here in Cedar Rapids. I don't live in Cedar Rapids, but um, we got iced in this morning. So that got rescheduled till next week. Um, so if you wanna catch me on uh, CBS Fox, uh, by all means, um, next Wednesday, I'll be on the morning show. Uh, I don't know. They always say between seven and 7.30 and it's always around 7.15. Um, they give me three minutes. Um, I'm proud to say I've been on there a few times and I think I've averaged about three minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, with my with my segment. So um, I talked to the producer yesterday and she said they must really like you because uh, uh, the 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 uh, host keeps me on a little bit longer. Um, so anyway, and, and the host um, intermittent fast and we're going to talk about that uh, next week. So nonetheless, um, uh, if you want to catch um, intermittent fasting lecture, by all means, um, tune in uh, live. We'll be streaming that somewhere. I don't know if it'll be a Zoom drop in like this or if it'll be on Facebook live, uh, but somehow we're going to be streaming that. Um, and recording it. We'll definitely get it on the YouTube channel and definitely get it into the video archives um, at our Epic 5 Plan um, Teachable uh, site. And then uh, I hope to see you guys uh, tomorrow as well. Tomorrow, um, we are covering lectins, as a matter of fact, a deeper dive into lectins. Um, and so we're going to talk about all that stuff. Um, are, are all plants okay? And if they're not, why not? And what, you know, what should we do about it? So I'm going to be covering all of that stuff tomorrow. Um, and again, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, we'll be on uh, noon tomorrow. And uh, I love you guys. I hope that you're enjoying the detox. Remember, post the pictures of your food, post the recipes. I failed you guys last night. I should have done this. Um, and Christy, just to make you feel good, we ate leftover chicken soup that I made on Monday last night. Um, I don't know what I mean tonight, but it'll be fun. 
um, it'll be on plan and I'll make something for you guys. Again, not anything elaborate. You know, my cooking is very simple, um, but I'll take pictures of the ingredients. I'll give you guys recipe and I'll try to take a picture of the outcome. Um, anyway, love you guys. Have a great rest of the day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.